Hey guys, I want to share a devotion the Lord had put on my heart this week for, um, for actually for something else, but um, I want to go ahead and share it because I, I hope it encourages, hope it encourages you. Ephesians 1, 11, um to 14 says, In him we are also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purposes of his will in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So I want to mention what triggers the receipt of an inheritance is the death of the testator. Since Jesus was the testator, his death on the cross triggered our right to the receipt of our inheritance now. As soon as the cross, as soon as he died on the cross, we gained access to the right to receive our inheritance. We have an inheritance on this earth during this life. We know the scripture that says, I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. There's a fullness offered to us while we are living. We need to walk in so that his glory is shown here through us. I ask that the eyes, Ephesians 1.18 says, I ask that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know the hope of his calling, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Because we are called and sealed, we can know the hope that lies within our calling and the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. This is not about just us living out fullness, but about the souls that populate heaven because when they see us and hear us, they see and hear him. And they want that same favor, mercy and grace and abundant life. So this, we as a body, were also his inheritance. Colossians one twenty seven says, To them... God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Have you ever suddenly remembered a dream and the entirety of the dream played in your mind in a second? I had a moment recently where I remembered a dream this way. There were two people on, if you can imagine, a metal cord stretched across the sky, blue sky, clouds brushed across, and there were these two people in the middle of the wire crossing the sky. The second person held on to the first person, but as they reached the middle, the second person saw how high they were, and he began to panic. He was too scared to go any further, and he called out for a rescuer. The rescuer came, connected to a parachute to take the second guy down. As the first person looked on at them, Going back down, he just shook his head like, you would have been fine. You were safe. You would have crossed. And I thought, if only he had stayed, he could have crossed the sky. It got me thinking of when we're in situations where we find ourselves in our minds, we think we're unsafe or we think we're unstable and we're tempted or even convinced to call out for a rescuer and let go. We give up the path that we're on for one that feels safer to us. But as I was looking on at the two of them, I could see as long as he held on to him, he would have been fine. And he could have crossed the sky. The first person was the one doing all the work. The second one only had to hold on. I've prayed the last few weeks for encouragement because I just see things that when I look at them, they bring a wave of unrest and discouragement and even instill a sense of insecurity. Uh, By that I mean unsafeness. I know what to do. It's pray. Not just praying, but staying in a continual state of communion with Jesus. A continual holding on to Jesus. The second man was out where he had never been before. And he made it halfway across the sky. And he was safe the whole time. But when he looked at his surrounding being so high in the sky, he felt unsafe and panic gripped his heart and stopped him from going any further. I've said before and prayed that I want everything that was offered to me on the cross. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, came and died for me on the cross to give me a gift. 
This gift wasn't just a, wasn't a single gift, but rather a lifetime of treasures that in him I would get to walk out and discover as I journey here on earth. This is the inheritance, but he didn't just give them to me to have, but he gave them to me so that I would use them. The treasures are not given to be kept hidden away and stored away. He wants us to operate in the gifts and in the fullness provided at the cross. So I want to talk about that. His designed purpose for us, our gifts and callings, are so beautifully unique. After the Holy Spirit fell in the upper room in Acts chapter 2 verse 3, the Bible says that divided tongues appeared over each of them and they each heard in their own native language. Acts tells us that people from every nation were there. In that same chapter, it tells, you know, it lists the different places that they were all from. Every nation were there together. I think this represents that the gifts fall individually on each of us, but the message is one message, the fullness offered in Jesus Christ. They each received an individual outpouring, but they were all together to accomplish one thing. There wasn't individual separate missions in the upper room. There was one goal, that salvation and the infilling of the Holy Spirit would come to all. Peter, when he explained what was happening, said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, our salvation and our sovereign King. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles and brethren, What shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. As many as the Lord our God will call. This is what I hear the Lord saying. The projection of hope that this world is looking for and needs, by the way, is a body that dwells together in unity and allows the gifts to operate fully, individually, but functioning together. This is what will attract the masses. The beauty of this diversity, not a diversity in belief systems, but a diversity in the giftings, the body, men, women, children, the mother, the business owner, the teenager, the leader, the layman, all accessing the fullness offered to them on the cross and operating from that foundation of fullness, accomplishing one work, salvation and the infilling of the Holy Spirit to the fullness of Christ. This is when the body will attract the masses. This is when the picture comes together. Wisdom says, allow the giftings to operate together. We're all so uniquely designed. I think here, though, he also wants to caution us, especially if you're a leader, to caution you of the tendency to compare yourselves to one another. The Bible says we are unwise to compare ourselves by ourselves. Jesus is our measuring stick, not one another. Second Corinthians 10 verse 12 says, We dare not, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Comparison takes the focus off of what God is doing and has placed inside of you, and you make yourself a judge of your brother or sister considering their gifting as something that is either inferior or superior to your own. Divided tongues appeared over each one of them. Our God, the creator of the universe, can certainly place a perfectly individualized calling and gifting and purpose inside of you. And what a waste of time comparison is. Remember Ephesians 1 says, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. We can't look down or around, and if we do... If we don't look up quickly and hold on to Jesus, we, when we give up too soon, when we let go too soon, we miss out on crossing the sky. This is one of the tragic results of comparison. You feel like you're either not measuring up or 
you're pouring out too much and you want to give up. If we hold on to him, he has with him everything we have need of. Everything. Our fullness is in Jesus, is in holding on to him. So the man called for the rescuer and the rescuer came and took him down, but he would have been fine as long as he held on. The first guy looked on at him and he said, why did you let go and leave? You could have crossed the sky. If you find yourself out here hanging on and scared and maybe you want to call for a rescuer, know this, the rescuer will come and you will be safe. But as long as you are holding on to Jesus, you were never in danger. Don't miss out on crossing the sky. Hang on. I asked the Lord actually this morning for a confirmation of what to say with this devotion. And the scripture that he showed me was Luke um, chapter 16, verse 12. And it says, and if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? He's saying you can't serve. He, he He told me you can't serve God's purpose and your own agenda at the same time. The scripture goes on to say how he knows our hearts. Don't look around you. It's just you and him and what he wants to do in you and through you. Let him do the work in you so he can accomplish the work through you. Psalm 17, 15 says, as for me, I will be satisfied when I awake in your likeness, not in the likeness of some person, some brother or sister or pastor or minister, but in his likeness. He is the measuring stick. So I'll end by saying this. I had been praying recently and I ended the prayer in Jesus' name. And I wrote the question down, what all, what all does it mean when I say in Jesus' name? That carries so much weight in Jesus' name. And I think we say it so often, just so much out of habit, that we should be reminded of the power that is in the name of Jesus. The Bible shows that when we say in the name of Jesus, we're evoking and agreeing with all that his name encompasses. And so I want to list out, so we're reminded of just some of the things the name of Jesus carries with it. We can utterly rely on Jesus, his sacrifice to his victory to now reigning king. He is our righteousness. He is our freedom. He is our standard. He is our strong tower. He's our refuge, our strength, our enduring hope forever, our sustaining grace. In him, all fullness dwells. He's the hope of glory, the weighty glory of the father. He is the truth and the way and the life. In him, we live and move and breathe and have our being. He's our direction, our lighted path. He is wisdom. He is our peace. He's the prince of peace. In him is our victory. He has all things under his feet. He is the head of all principality and power. He is our reconciliation, our life, our abundant life, our healing. He is mercy. He is our deliverer. He is our protection, our foundation. He is our covering, our home, our safe place, our surrounding grace. He gives us wisdom. He is wisdom. And he gives us soundness of mind. He is perfect love. And I'm sure as long as I live, I will find him to be all of this and even more. So I want to encourage you today not to compare your gift and calling with others. Let's embrace each other and celebrate the diversity in the body, the diversity of the gifts and callings, and the body who the Lord has called according to his purpose. Let's celebrate his purpose together. And I want to encourage you if you want to let go because maybe you panicked. Don't. God says, hang on. I got you. You're safe. Thanks for listening and reading along if you read along. Um, I pray you were encouraged. And I'll talk to you all soon. Be blessed.